Chapter three, part two, the British Atlantic world. So we're, we're talking and leading up to this idea of what that is. What is the British Atlantic world or the British Atlantic system? And this is where the uh, slave trade, the, the Atlantic slave trade, the middle passage, that this is where all this comes into play. As the, as the English establish themselves as the dominant European power in the new world, they start to make great wealth from all the products being being uh, you know dug out of the out of the earth in many cases in the new world <clears throat> by manufacturing them and selling them at higher prices. <clears throat> slavery became the popular choice for labor. Uh, so this is where slavery takes hold in, in what would be the coming United States. So understand that initially slavery was in the north and the south. It, it was initially legal in the north also. It was just less integral to the north's economy than the south. Uh, so slave populations were generally smaller in the north than the south. And it was all about geography. Again, I've mentioned this before. Stony, uh, hilly uh, land, uh, you know, uh, geography not conducive to large-scale um, uh, agriculture. You have very uh, cold, harsh winters. The south is the, is the opposite. Mild winters, uh, no, typically no, no winter to speak of. Uh, a lot of water, a lot of rain, warm temperatures, so two different areas. So slavery didn't didn't work that great in the north, but they still had it in the beginning. Uh, but northern textile mills and other and other businesses benefited from slave labor. Uh, as we move on and get into the cotton era, the textile mills in the north relied on southern cotton. This was intensified by the invention of the cotton gin. And so the cotton gin we'll talk more about later. But briefly, a machine that made the processes of processing of cotton much easier and faster. It made it more profitable. And like I said, we'll talk, we'll talk more at length about the cotton gin. So understand, the North had a vested, vested interest in the survival of slavery in the South, also because they wanted Southern cotton. Uh, so by 1810, 1810 uh, a Generation after the revolution, you know, over one fourth of all Northern African Americans were still enslaved. So one fourth of all black people in the North were still slaves. Uh, but by 1840, it had greatly diminished in the North. But understand again, that's only 20 years before the Civil War. Uh, you know, the, the perception among the general public and many historians is that slavery died relatively quickly in the North with different state abolition laws. But evidence suggests that slavery persisted in the North well into the 19th century. <clears throat> in, seven, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1770, there were 19,062 black slaves in New York. That was more slaves in New York than there were in Georgia in, in 1770. 40% <clears throat> of white households in Manhattan owned slaves. Um, you know, house slaves. Uh, New Jersey, the last state to abolish uh, slavery. Uh, there was a slow death of slavery in Pennsylvania, 1830s and 40s, New York, 1830s. Uh, so that's a, this, this is close to the Civil War, is what the point I'm trying to make. Uh, in fact, the last sale that, that was on the U.S. Census in the north of a slave was in, in February of 1856, only five years before the war that was fought to end slavery. A farmer was preparing to relocate to Illinois and he sold his slave that, uh, that was, he called his slave for life. Her name was Catherine. She was 67 years old. He sold her for $20. So a slave trade is happening in New Jersey, a Northern state only five years before the civil war. Uh, so New Jersey's gradual abolition law provided freedom for children born as slaves, but only after they had served their mother's master for 24 years. So children had to serve 24 years before they were free. That's a long time, but at least it's 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 dangling out there. You know, the previous or in the South, a slave had no chance to be free in their, their lifetime and their children's lifetime. The stereotype that we see today of, of the people in the North that were anti-slavery or carrying people who fought a huge war to free the slaves, and that's not entirely true. When the war began, it was not the, the, the men in the North didn't come to fight to save to abolish slavery. They came to preserve the Union and for a sense of adventure. The, the truth is the North had little need for slavery on a huge scale. But if there had been a need, 
slavery would have existed there on a large scale also. So the point I'm trying to make is it's easy to say the North were kind and the, and the South were mean, slaveholders. But they really were, were the same people with the same discriminations and, and racist you know, ideologies. Uh, it's just that the South was was much more, uh, you know, in, in, engaged in the, in the practice. The North was not. If if there had been a, a an, an economic opportunity in the North that required millions of slaves, and the South had their opportunity, that this entire country probably would have stayed slave for a lot lot longer than it did. Uh, so again, not the good guys versus the bad guys. Okay, so let's let's go on to this British Atlantic system and the, the British Atlantic world is the is the uh, title of our chapter. So this is a, a couple of maps that show you the, uh, the how Britain is incorporating the New World and Africa into their economic system that makes them extremely wealthy. So I mentioned before, there's three legs. There's a whole lot of arrows going on here, but essentially. Uh, in the colonies, they ship raw goods to England. England manufactures, sends, sends goods out to, to sell at higher prices. But before they come back to the New World to sell their goods, they come to Africa to sell a few goods, but mostly to get slaves. And then, of course, here, uh, this is the long journey back from the slaves. This is called the Middle Passage. This is the the slave trade part of it. Then you see you bring slaves back because they're they're a huge part of this of this economic structure. So this is a little bit a little bit uh, uh, understandable, this on the right side. So leg one from, from the New World to England, England to Africa, and slaves back. That's the triangular trade, okay? Uh, so the British Atlantic system it became the name for this new agricultural and commercial order and it, whose success was hinged on slavery. So understand that, that that's a huge part of our, our, our culture and society today and the strife we have in the streets, uh, the, you know, slavery was a huge part of the economic success to what made this country. And that's where reparations talks comes from because many countries that are still around, I'm sorry, many businesses, uh, multiple corporations today uh, that are still existing and, and, and doing well got their start from slave labor. Um, okay, so uh, so this this system became known as the triangular trade, and you, you know plantations in South America are also uh, you know getting slaves, especially Brazil. Brazil produced sugar, rice, and indigo. Um, so we've been taught growing up that slavery was in the American South, and we tend to think it wasn't anywhere else. It was just here. I mean, slavery was all over the New World. Uh, in fact, only five hundred thousand came to the what would become the United States. I mean, that's a lot, don't get me wrong, but but it was much larger elsewhere. Uh, so 12 million slaves set out for the New World. Only 10.7 survived the passage. And we, we what happened to the 1.3? It went overboard. What happened to the, uh, I'm sorry, out of that number, how many were actually dead? Pr probably most, but some were not if you were sick and they didn't want to take care of you. It's all about business. If there's spoilage, throw it out. Throw, throw the live person over, overboard also. So slaves go into Brazil. You know, this, uh, Brazil turned out to be a huge economic opportunity for Portugal and later Spain. And they duplicated the model for plantations that the Portuguese started in that little island, Sao Tome. So how many slaves went to Brazil? 3.7 million, more than seven times what came to the United States. What about Central America? It's a much smaller area, 1.5 million, three times more than what came to the United States. All the Caribbean islands, 3.3 million, six to seven times more than what came to the United States. So slavery uh, was not a small, uh, you know, kind of uh, institution. It, it, it flourished everywhere as the Europeans came and colonized. That's the system that they used. To you know, get their get their wealth out of out of the ground. Uh, so so we understand in in this South Atlantic system, America was a minor player uh, compared to others. Uh, look at this map. We'll talk more about the slave trade, but this this gives us a little bit better idea of the triangle. So from from the New World, sugar, coffee, tobacco, raw materials, but you could also add you know cotton and timber and furs and, and indigo and ink and foodstuffs, though not, not just those three. 
they go to Europe, <clears throat> Europe manufactures them, and then they come out with textiles, so clothing, uh, brandy, arms, but also wooden tables, chairs, you know, any kind of item you can you can manufacture with the with the materials you get from the New World. So why do they go to Africa? They they sell a few items, but they mostly want to get slave. And then of course you see that 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 bottom uh, black arrow, the very very long journey for these people, and that would be the the uh, what's called the middle passage uh that's the that's the leg that that is the bringing the slaves over okay uh <clears throat> so the image you see at the bottom of this slide is from an 18th century broadside called description of the slave ship so today we call we we call we, we would call a broadside a poster okay uh, but this is a schematic of the bottom of a slave ship and if you look really closely at that image that's not a a design or a texture. Those are people that are that are side by side, um, crammed in using every possible inch. They did, they didn't say you know to go to the bottom and find yourself a spot. No, they brought them in one by one and fit them in so they would take up they could get as many people as they could in because there's going to be spoilers. It's just like a like produce. You know, on, on the way some of the some of the uh, product spoils. If a person gets sick and dies, you throw them overboard. If a person was sick with no hope for recovery, you throw them overboard alive. It wasn't about human beings. It was about business and, and spoilage. So uh, this is a horrible, um, uh, shameful uh, moment in human history and specifically United States history. Uh, so they, so the, the, the slaves are kidnapped from their village, uh, brought to the coast, kept in a kind of a prison for a while until they get enough to take a journey across the ocean. And they're stuffed in the ships like sardines, overcrowded, filthy. Uh, they line in their own waists. Uh, there's, there's no bathroom breaks. You just do your business where you're at for, for months. Okay. No, no one's going to clean you up. Uh, <clears throat> this is what it was like. Uh, it, it, it's it's a bit of a myth to believe that these the, these horrible white men went to Africa and went into the interior and kidnapped slaves themselves. That did happen, but not as on a, as large a scale as you might think. It typically was Africans kidnapping Africans and bringing them out to the coast and selling them to the slave traders. So the Africans were involved in in this also okay? because it may, it makes you money. Uh, people like money. <clears throat> So we talked about, you know, we're talking about America here. So we talked about Jamestown, almost a failure, but tobacco in the South it saved it and kicked it off. And, <clears throat> and the people started to prosper and, and the slaves started coming. And you have this uh, the explosion of the Atlantic slave trade. Let's take a break here and watch our first film. This film is in called The Atlantic Slave Trade. Please watch that film and then come on back. <coughs> okay. So in the case of the Amic style, like the movie talks about, where slaves took over a ship and were given their freedom, this is a great story. But understand, it only happened one time. Uh, all the other thousands and thousands of slave trader ships arrived in America just fine with their tragic cargo. But it is a true story. The 35 survivors of the Amic style returned to Africa in 1842, funded by... Uh, 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 aided by funds raised by the United Missionary Society, uh, a group founded by Futures of Slaves, so an early, I'm sorry, not an early, an abolitionist organization. Uh, so in the United States, what would become the United States, slavery began in the Chesapeake uh, area, Virginia, North Carolina, not, not in the South, that would, that would come later. This is still considered the South, but it's the upper South. So you look at the map here and the satellite view of, of the Chesapeake, you see that it's a it's a it's a huge inland waterway. And and these are very key to civilizations and, and, and you know culture and commerce uh taken off. You you've got a, a, a protected waterway that's that's free of the of the currents and the violence of the of the ocean itself. So plantations flourished along these waterways and mostly tobacco in the early years. And we talked about that. Um, so the Chesapeake gave gave these planters easy access to the Atlantic to ship products, and the slaves came as the as the, the tobacco fields grew. and And this practice of treating your slaves with brutality and racism and oppression began. Okay, uh, 
Slavery became about color in the United States. It hadn't slavery been around for many for the entirety of human history, but only in the United States, in the Americas, did it become about the color of your skin. If you were black, it meant you were a slave. It meant you were a slave for life. So what was it like in these early plantations? It's an interesting uh, image. This is called Virginia Luxuries. <clears throat> so this was actually found uh, in the north. A, a Probably a housekeeper was uh, dusting the pictures on the wall of, of somebody's home. <clears throat> and they took a picture off the wall, and it's a picture of a man. I don't know who the man was. We could probably find out, but it's not, it's not relevant to our story. It doesn't really matter. Took a picture of a man off the wall, and behind it was, was painted this, and it says Virginia Luxury. So what do they mean by luxuries? So historians have been arguing about this painting for years. You know, what, what does it mean? Is, is, it, is it two scenes or, or one scene? Uh, so I, I tend to believe it's one. If you follow the, the trim here on the wall, it, it kind of hits here and it continues at a little bit of an angle. So that's, to, 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 to me, you're inside of a room and this is an inside corner of the room and, and that's, you know, the, the, the trim continues. So in, in my mind, it's one image, uh, but there's, there's, no, there's no right or wrong. That, that's just my opinion. <clears throat> so what's happening in this picture? Well, you see, you know, a white man and a black woman in an embrace. Another white man is about to uh, beat a black man with his cane. So what is the suggestion here? Well, I mean, what do they mean by luxury? So this, this is kind of the way it was for these white men on these large plantations. It could be a Saturday, Friday, or Saturday night. The work probably a Saturday night. The work week's over. Uh, you know, uh, the the white men, the the southern planters, they 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 drank excessively. So you get a little drunk, and you, you and your friend go out down to the slave quarters just to to make some hell, and perhaps you run across a a you know, a slave couple. And now this could be a husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, mother, son, sister, brother. We we don't know. They they run across <clears throat> this uh, this couple, and one man decides I have a fancy for this woman. And we've already seen this. You know, they could do that whenever they want it. So they so they take the woman and begin to embrace her. Now some students say she, it doesn't look like she's uh, you know holding him back. And that's true, uh, but I wouldn't say she's happy about it. She she learned a, a woman of that age would learn many years prior that she can't, you know, uh, say no or push them away. That, that that might end in her getting beaten or perhaps even killed. Okay, so she has to comply with what what he wants her to do. Her the 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 African uh, male slave. Uh, he is in a position. What can he do? We saw the we saw the film with Mariah Carey, where the her husband can't defend her when the white man takes her, and that's what's happening here. The the white man with the cane saying, "Don't you even think about stopping them," and of course the black man can't because he knows it'll cost him, him, her, or both of their lives and perhaps their family. That's just the way that it was. So this this is. This, this is this is cruelty on a on a incredible level, and, and racism and hate and and humiliation. It, it, it's it's horrifying. Uh, but so what happens to this black man? I uh, he he suffers what's called emasculation. So what does that mean? Emasculation is when you take away a male's maleness. So what what do I mean by maleness? Well, it's kind of ingrained in us as men. And we're taught this way growing up in our culture that we, you know, should protect women, especially our women, meaning, meaning, you know, mothers, sisters, uh, wives, girlfriends. We protect them. <clears throat> if something happens to a woman in your life and you're there and you did, you couldn't stop it. You, you've been emasculated. You, you, you've been shamed. Your, your, your male, uh, you know, hormone or whatever DNA gene. That, that tells you to protect has been has been stymied and it makes you less of a man and it's it's shameful and embarrassing. So of course this is something that that black slave black male slaves had to deal with all the time, uh, the emasculation. Okay, so th does that have a long term effect? I mean you could you could argue that many many African American males today still experience this type of treatment in in our modern society. Okay. Um, 
and, and it, why there's so many incarcerated today. I mean, it, it, it's a very interesting uh, topic of research and history to study the emasculation of black males in, in American history and the effects it's had on on them as a as a group of people. <clears throat> So, so whatever whatever the scene means, it, it's it's the 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 idea that the person that painted it said luxuries. Uh, it's it's somewhat of a of a facetious ha ha ha. Look look what we can do, right? So, um, understand it was against the law for sexual relations between a black and a white, but it did not apply to plantation owners and his female slaves because that was business. Um, it it really was designed to keep uh, keep people of the same race from marrying and having mixed race children. That was a that was a frightening thing to to uh, white pl uh, planters, you know, mixing like that. Uh, of course, we live in a world today where where many many people are mixed, and it's not a problem at all. And, and these people are perfectly fine like any, like anybody else. I mean, we we're we're all mixed from something. There is no pure race anywhere. I mean. Uh, we're, we, we've all got a number of different, you know, uh, kind of genealogies in us. Uh, a white person could not be tried for murdering a black. They were his property. He could not be tried for raping or punishing or torturing or, or uh, committing atrocities, mutilating. You, you just had no, no, nothing to stop you. So the African slaves were just simply at the mercy of their owner. If they had a sadistic owner, they were in trouble, and many of them were. Not all of them, but many of them were. Uh, this behavior continued through the cotton years. It intensified in the cotton years, as we'll find out later in this class. Uh, slavery would explode in, in intensity, brutality, through the first half of the 19th century until the Civil War finally ended it. But say, after saying all that, a slave lived better in the United States English colonies than they did in Brazil, the Caribbean, uh, because you don't have a smothering tropical environment like you do down there. Lots of disease in that type of environment. But also tobacco was less strenuous than sugar, although later with the success of the cotton industry in the Deep South, that was strenuous also, and the Deep South also had some humid conditions. So cooler weather was, was as a slave, was where you'd want to be, because cooler weather was not as conducive to disease as, as uh, elsewhere. <clears throat> so we talked about how female slaves were encouraged to have children with other slaves, or many were fathered by the slave's owner and other male members of the family. And this is a quote out of your book about how they felt about these women. Be kind and indulgent to the breeding wenches, and do not force them when with child upon any service of hardship that will be injurious to them. Are they being nice? No, they want to protect their investment. Okay, they they, they want that that slave child because now you got a free slave. You don't have to pay for that. Uh, but they're being you know insulting and and condescending, calling these women breeding wenches. They 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 were they were breeding because they were forced to. It wasn't because they wanted to. I don't know that you you would call them wenches. Um, that's just an insult. Okay, <clears throat> but but very interestingly, out of the oppression developed a community you know slaves were free to mingle with each other at night when the sun went down and the work day ended the white folk would go back to their big house and, and do their thing and the slaves were left to their own devices in, in the slave quarters uh, so they were free to mingle with each other and get to know each other and friends and, and marriages and and um, you know you 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 know people become very close to each other when you are in a precarious situation together, okay? Uh, so your, your book calls it a nation within a, within a nation. They, the slaves created their own separate world away from white eyes. So at, in the evenings and on Sundays, typically Sundays was their day off, they, could, they were free to live their life with their, with their people the way that they wanted without the you know, fear of a whip coming down on them. Of course, like the Virginia luxury showed us, though, if, if, if the white men wanted to come in and, they, and start trouble, they, there was no stopping them. Okay? Uh, so according to Thomas Jefferson, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I missed one, one part here. Uh, slaves were overpunished for small or even perceived infractions. 
Uh, the planners gain complete control by using cruelty as a force to instill fear. So even a even a, a minor misstep by a slave could result in him or her being whipped in front of the slave population to to make a point, to be used as an example. And here you see the man on the left here. Um, this person was whipped how many times? I mean, imagine the incredible pain that man had gone through. Now that person was probably a a uh, a, a runaway numerous times, kept on running away, kept on getting punished. Okay. Uh, but you see the damage and the welts and the scars on that man. The man on the right uh, has got this iron collar around his neck with these spikes. What what is that? This would be, this would be something that they would put on a person that ran away. You've also see if he's got chains around his ankle with maybe a, a a ball. And these are all designed to allow you not to run so easy. So the ball, of course, would hold you back from running, but the spikes from the collar. We get caught in the trees as you ran, you know, in, into the woods to, to escape. It would get you all tangled up. And th this person was forced to wear this all day. And it, might, it, it could even be for a long period of time, months, uh, in, in the fields all day. You can imagine that that rubbing against your neck like that. Uh, okay, so back to Thomas Jefferson. Um, he he uh, he determined, according to, to Jefferson, each generation of whites was nursed, educated, and daily exercised in tyranny. <clears throat> the relationship between master and slave was a perpetual exercise of the most unremitting despotism on the one part and degrading submission on the other. And of course, he would know. He, he grew up on a plantation his whole life. Uh, Thomas Jefferson had uh, over 600 slaves in his lifetime on his, on his own plantation. So, interesting point of view from a man. Who own that many slaves? He's, he's somewhat, he's somewhat, uh, you know, insulting himself. And this is the enigma of Thomas Jefferson, a man who says that everyone's equal, but he owns 600 people. Jefferson's friend and neighbor George Mason claimed that every master is a born tyrant. Uh, with power comes corruption. All power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. I mean, is that true, or is it a choice people make? So does wealth and power always mean it that it leads to corruption? I mean, I don't I don't buy that, but but many people do. So Jefferson and his in his in his kind are trying to, in a roundabout way, give give you an excuse why they're abusive to their slaves, because power corrupts. Uh interesting. Uh is this the answer why the white slave owners were so cruel to their slaves? Perhaps. What what about rebellions? Why didn't why didn't the slaves rebel? Uh, and you know Con Kanye oops, Kanye West made a, a, a comment a while ago about you know that slavery was a choice that the slaves were you know outnumbered the whites why didn't they just fight back? Yeah, you know, a, a a very you know ignorant comment. Yeah, I don't mean to say the man's ignorant, but let let's just say an unenlightened comment a. a an uneducated comment, a person that doesn't know the psychological warfare that these people went through. Yes, there were hundreds of them in some cases versus maybe a dozen or two whites, but they were under constant scrutiny with guns on them and whips and all kinds of sadistic tortures that they could be subject to if they stepped out of line. So it wasn't as easy to do. They also kept them apart so they wouldn't come together and organize. But on occasion it happened. Of course, a, a rebellion is the is the you know most frightening thing uh for a slave owner. It's it's the, the their greatest fear. Uh because they're they they're they're worried about being murdered in their sleep, in their beds. So again, another reason why they were so cruel was to scare the slaves from organizing and rebellion rebelling. So the Stono Rebellion was one of the early uh, rebellions. Uh, this happened on plantations on and near the Stono River in South Carolina. Uh, many uh, This uprising of slaves resulted in many plantations being damaged. 20 white people were killed before it was suppressed. And we're going to learn more uh, of these later. We'll talk about the Nat Turner Rebellion that, that happens more towards the Civil War. But the, the the one rebellion or revolution that you have to talk about is 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 Haiti. Okay, what happened in, in Haiti? Tough time with my clicker here. Come on. There we go. The Haitian Revolution. 
uh, so so what is, so what happened here? So so Haiti at that time uh, was a was an island called called Saint Domingue, and it was a French colony, and it was a very uh, uh, prosperous sugar plantation, very small island just south of Cuba. Uh, so the French started bringing their slaves in from the Congo, okay, in in Africa. So the Congo was more in the in the interior than the slaves were that were typically being taken off the coast of on the on the west side. They decided to go to the Congo. What they didn't realize is that if you were a young man, so a typical age slave that they'd want to have would be men aged 15 to 25, because they're going to be hard workers in, in their prime. Of course, women were taken in numbers too to procreate, to create more slaves. But mostly they want they wanted young men. Um, if you were a young man, 15 to 25, in the Congo, your whole life had been about warfare and civil wars, and you learned, uh, you know, how to, uh, you know, um, the strategy of war and how to organize and, and you know, how to, how to, uh, you know, move people in the field, you know, tactics, military uh, training was what you learned from day one. They, the, these young, these young Congo. Uh, men and women weren't playing hide and go seek with their friends. They they were, they they lived in a violent world. So they were very well schooled in in military. So the French came in and grabbed them all and took them to to Saint Domingue. And because of their of their experience in, in with with military, they were able to organize and rise up against uh, the French and actually overthrew the French rule in in Saint Domingue. Uh, over, you know, uh, defeated Napoleon himself. Okay, that's that was the the uh, leader of the French in, in that time. Uh, so it's a pretty amazing story. And of course, they they start the first black uh, republic, and they call it Haiti. Okay, uh, <clears throat> let's take another uh, break here and watch the film entitled "The Haitian Revolution" documentary. Uh, go ahead and watch that film, and then come back. Okay, so the film took us into the present day ahead of where we are in this class, but understand that this is a very key event in American history based on the effect it had on slavery in the United States. So how do we relate a, a rebellion in Haiti to American history? Well, when the, when the American plantation owners learned that, that, that there had been a successful slave revolt in Haiti, this, this concerned them greatly. This is their greatest fear. What if it happened here? Um, how did the slaves feel about? It? They were inspired by. It. They they were they were thrilled. This, this gave them hope. So what's the result? You got you got one group that the plantation owners are fearful and scared. The other group is happy and jubilant. That that made the white plantation owners come down on them even harder, and they turned the screws even harder. So the result of the Haitian Revolution in the in the United States was a deep division, a further divide between the two races. Uh, blacks were already living in squalor, had no rights, they were property chattel, they had no hope for the future but abuse and degradation. That was all, that was their lives, but now it even got worse. And even, even, uh, you know, other, other plantation owners could abuse your slaves if they felt they were being out of line. So, um, it, it, it was absolute combat and warfare every day for a slave to survive the day after the Haitian Revolution. <clears throat> So who are these people at the top in, in in this slave society? These white plantation owners, they're they're known as the Southern Gentry. Uh, so understand, their society, their white society, mostly mostly Protestant, prospered from slavery in a huge way. They didn't have to work. Uh, they became incredibly wealthy from the labor of from the backs of African Americans. And they used their wealth to rule and, and dominate and oppress. And they ruled over other white yeoman farmers, you know, the smaller independent farmers, non-slaveholders. Uh, they relied on violence and abuse to control the black slaves. So in, in, that, in that culture, uh, slaveholders were considered to be the highest of the social class. Uh, the way to achieve upward mobility was to own more slaves. Uh, in a typical church in that time, uh, you know, the, you'd have the pews that people would sit in, and the and the front pew was was always uh, reserved for the family with the most slaves, and then it would kind of go backward from there. 
So the, the family with the most slaves in the first pew in the back of the room would be the yeoman farmers that had no slaves. If the slaves were allowed to come into the church and see the service, they, they had to be up on the balcony and were not allowed to mix with the white. Like they had their own kind of back entrance stairway to go and not mix. Okay. Uh, okay, so you have a rise of a southern aristocracy, a gentry, very similar to the way it had been in Europe. People came from Europe to get away from that, but in the south they, they redeveloped that whole idea. It's almost like the old feudal system in a little bit different way. Uh, and you have this idea called gentility. So gentility is a refined style of living that included elaborate manners and, and customs. And, and, and the word Gentile, it comes from the word Gentile. So Gentile is, is, a, is a way to describe a non-Jewish person. So Protestant people, that's who they were. So gentility is a refined, elaborate lifestyle. A person's gentry was another way of defining their social status. Southern gentry was the social structure in the colonies, and it was how others saw them. So the upper strata, the, the, the top of the pyramid, included people like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Robert E. Lee. Uh, it was highly prized among well-to-do white colonial families to be in that you know, upper strata, okay? Uh, so, so merchants in the north, come on, here we go. Uh, I mentioned this before, the plantation societies in the south and the Caribbean created a huge market for New England goods. Uh, so the North, from the beginning, relied on the South as a market, and, and as I said before also, later with cotton as a supplier of raw goods they could manufacture with. Uh, so many white Northerners also became very wealthy from transatlantic commerce. So this is the idea of the British Atlantic world, the title of the chapter. Uh, Britain dominated the region and became a very powerful and wealthy country from it. Uh, by the time of the revolution, Britain was the superpower in the world. So you're talking about the 1700s. So we go back, we talked about Queen Elizabeth and the Spanish Armada, where they, where they weren't there. <clears throat> they are just getting started. <clears throat> so in 200 years between the Armada and the American Revolution, the, the British rise to be the, the superpower of the world. Okay. Let's just take a little sidebar here and, and talk about something. So... Why, why, do, why do I say Britain sometimes and England sometimes? Or what about Great Britain? What, what, is, what does that all mean? So it's a little confusing, so I'm going to try to clear it up for you. So when I say England, I mean England, the, the country of England, here it is. Okay, that's, that's the borders of England. If I say Britain, that means England and you add Wales in. So now Britain would be, would be all of this. Okay, so England's just, just the country. Britain is all of it. When you add in Scotland, that's the entire island, you now have Great Britain, okay? So, so Britain has to do with England, Wales, and Scotland. Ireland's got nothing to do with Britain. Okay? Ireland's a, a different country by itself. But when you add in Northern Ireland, uh, it becomes known as the United Kingdom. So England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland is the United Kingdom. You add in the entirety of Ireland, now you have both islands. All of it is called the British Isles. So why is Ireland separate from the other, uh, from England and Scotland? Uh, well, you know, Ireland was, uh, Ireland and English didn't get along very well. And, and the English, the English oppressed the, oppressed the Irish for, for many years. The English oppressed the Scottish for many years. The English were oppressive people. And these were colonizers and pretty abusive. Uh, but the reason why Ireland separated the North and South it goes back to that, that same issue of Protestants versus Catholics. And they had a very violent um, situation going on there, at, you know, in the in the mid 20th century also. So even more toward our modern times. Okay? That, that's kind of an overview of, of what I mean by Britain, Great Britain, England and so on. OK. OK, back to our story. So the colonial assemblies that were developed in the colonies. <clears throat> by the colonists. These became the first official forms of popular representation uh, prior to the American Revolution. So these, these assemblies provided the initial taste the colonies had for self-government. So again, England is far away with 3,000 miles across the Atlantic. Not so easy to monitor and control the colonists. So as long as they're sending us raw materials and we're, get, we're making money, 
they somewhat let them do what they wanted and run themselves. Of course, not realizing that they were planting the seeds of revolution because we they learned early on we, we can we can manage ourselves pretty well. What do we need these people for? Uh, so they really are the, the the colonial assemblies are the forerunners of future representational bodies that would emerge during and after the revolution that would of course give America its its uh, identity. Okay. So mostly the wealthy, influential men of a community became the leaders in these local assemblies. Uh, they they always labored to limit English authority. Uh, they they wanted self control. They, they they wanted to to you know create their own laws and and take care of themselves. Uh, they wanted to decide legislation on their own. This this angered England. Uh, but the colonists repeatedly and blatantly ignored English law. They got around tariffs. And shipping laws by smuggling. You know, many founding fathers became wealthy from smuggling. Uh, it's not because they're criminals; it's because they saw an opportunity to make money that the English held them back from, and so they took advantage of it anyway. So they didn't respect English laws or the English themselves. They they become they become American. The idea of an American people that were formerly English began to develop at this time. And of course, this would become the beginning of a people of who we are today, Americans in the United States. So England used a system called mercantilism, and this was a system of trade to control its economy. And it was uh, designed to corner the market uh, so they could have all the benefits and all the profits. No middleman, all, all the wealth comes to England. This is the main economic system of trade used during the 16th to 18th century, so a long time. Uh, throughout the entire um, colonial era in, in what would become the United States. So it was a system that oversaw all the nation's commercial interests <clears throat> to increase the nation's wealth by imposing government regulations. So that, that's the word we hear a lot of today, regulation. Government stepping in and regulating a, a, an industry. You, you didn't see it so much. So the English begin this this idea, okay? Okay. Uh, so, so what what is mercantilism? So, looking at the at this uh, these diagrams here, now the one on top, uh, this here and this is the same thing. So don't get confused about that. Uh, <clears throat> this is just a, a <clears throat> I can't talk. Sorry, guys. <clears throat> this this is just a a closer uh, look at at this here. Okay. So the whole idea of mercantilism <clears throat> is to maximize your national strength by limiting imports. And maximizing exports. So here you see the balance of trade. More exports, fewer imports. That means that you're selling or you're buying. So what does that result in? A a surplus in your treasury. Okay. Uh, don't don't buy that much, but sell as much as you can. That's going to result in a surplus of cash. Now these these two over here are the same idea we talked about before. Raw goods coming from the colonies, gold, silver, fur, lumber. To the mother country, they manufacture them and send them back at higher prices. So I, I may have used this example before. If, if you're in the lumber business in in the colonies, and you went into the into the woods and and cut down trees and you brought them back and you milled them down to lumber, two by fours, four by fours. Uh, let's just say you had this large space, you could easily uh, you know, build a workshop to manufacture tables and chairs on your own, but you weren't allowed to do that. You had to send the raw lumber to, to England, and then they would manufacture the chairs and tables, send them back to you, and you'd actually have to buy a table at a higher price made from your own lumber. This, this of course, didn't seem very fair to the colonists, and again, seeds of revolution are, are planted. So sell more than you buy, collect precious metals, gold and silver in return to build a reserve to establish great wealth. So it's important to understand that this. This is this is the system that England put into place once they established the colonies in America as a way to gain control of them. And and again, and this is this is a review, but it's it's good to reinforce. To take advantage of two things. We've already talked about this. Labor force. And raw resource. That's what a colony is. Not a not a friendly idea that supports people moving to new and exciting places. The colony's purpose is to take advantage of the land and the people that are living there. Uh, Columbus and the Tainos, uh, your first discussion board will be about that. You'll learn about how Columbus treated the, the Arawaks and the Tainos. Um, or in some cases, the workforce is sent to this new land. 
such as colonists, indentured, or slaves, uh, but always to extract raw material to ship to the mother country for manufacture. That is the basis for mercantilism. And to a mercantilist country, what measures your wealth? It's measured by how much gold and silver you have. Uh, the more the merrier. And if, if you don't have enough money, how do you get it? You sell more than you buy. So it had a strict set of rules, so a country gains more than it loses. Uh, so here you see an image cartoon where you see the mother country, and, and, and she seems very comfortable, uh, well-fed. She's got all the food she wants at her on her table, a glass of wine. She's refined. She's got jewelry. Uh, she's wealthy. She's prosperous. And then, and then here are, are her colonies bringing her all these all these items to, to create more wealth for her gold and silver, foodstuffs, raw materials. Uh, English ships and merchants were always favored in the attempt at courts which to exclude other countries from sharing in the British Empire's wealth. This made them very angry. Uh, so the colonists could only ship their goods to England, and that's it. You can't ship them anywhere else. You can't ship products to Spain on a Spanish ship. That's illegal, okay? Uh, between 1651 and 1673, uh, Parliament passed four navigation acts as part of this mercantilist system uh, that had to do with colonization to ensure the proper mercantilist trade balance. And so the acts declared the following. Number one, I, I mentioned this before, only English or English colonial ships could carry cargo between imperial ports. You can't be shipping with another country. Uh, you can't ship to Spain and make that money. You got to ship your goods to England. They then ship to Spain and make the money, okay? Certain goods, tobacco, rice, furs, could not be shipped to foreign nations except through England or Scotland. That's kind of the same as the first one. <clears throat> English Parliament would pay bounties to Americans to produce certain raw goods while raising protectionist tariffs on the same goods produced in other nations. So that, that's nice for the American business person, but, but understand they're not uh, gaining or prospering from what the English are. The English are cutting out uh, you know, um, uh, foreign goods uh, produced in other nations because they want to, to control all of it. They, they want the Americans to get the goods. They make the products. They make the money. Okay. Uh, and, and this one, the last one, is would be a point of contention that would lead to a revolution. I mentioned the, the, the person with the lumber business that can't can't make his own table. He's got to buy it at a higher price from the English. Americans could not compete with English manufacturers in large scale manufacturing. This this made the colonists very very angry. So they smuggled. Uh, so the colonists initially complained about these restrictions on trade. Uh, in New England, many colonists evaded the restrictions by, as I said, by smuggling. Uh, so these these acts were designed to severely restrict colonial trade to the benefit of England. But what it led to was the, the relations between the two, England and the colonists, became full of friction. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to completely contradict everything I just said. Because that's the real way history develops. So what do I mean? Uh, history doesn't always develop in a logical path. It's not always linear. Sometimes it goes off in the different directions and you're not, it doesn't make any sense. So what is solitary neglect? I wear my sunglasses so I, I, I can't see what those colonists over in America are up to, for now anyway. That's supposed to be King George III, by the way. <clears throat> so what is this policy? Navigation laws are only randomly enforced. Americans openly violate the Navigation Act to no serious consequences. That doesn't make any sense. Why, why come up with these harsh Navigation Act laws to control the colonists if you're going to let them get away with it? So England developed this policy of what's called what they called solitary neglect toward the colonists. And this became a long-standing British policy towards the American colonies. Uh, where they would let them get away with, with things, look the other way? Yes, in some in some way. Why? Why would they do that? England had, I mentioned before, had no effective enforcement agencies. It was expensive to send British troops to America. You had to house them, uh, feed them, and pay them. Um, and the Americans pretty much took care of themselves. So, solitary neglect allowed the colonists to violate 
uh, the laws associated with trade. And this lasted for about 70 years, 1690 to 1760. It, it came to a close as the era of the French and Indian Wars began, and we'll talk why about that here in a minute. Uh, so, of course, this benefited the colonists because it boosted their profits from trade because the English relaxed supervision and the colonists smuggled and got away with it. Uh, of course, England didn't, didn't realize, but they inadvertently were helping the Americans in their rise towards self-government. Because if you're going to look the other way, we're going to profit greatly here. And when they saw the, the, the you know, size of the profits, they thought, my gosh, we can just get rid of these people. We, we would do very, very well as our own country, okay? Uh, so it, interesting idea that English do not enforce their own laws. So, so why would they do that? Well, uh, again, Britain was threatened by the presence of the French in North America, and they knew at some point they would have to clash with them. And, and as I've said many times, we're, we're approaching these French and Indian Wars. Uh, they, they knew it, at some point there's going to be a war that's going to decide who's going to be the dominant player in the New World. And whoever loses is going to have to go home. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so the British realized that we need the colonists to support them when that time came. So the British did not want to alienate their much needed allies through aggressive trade restrictions. Uh, that may result in them siding with the French. So if, if the colonists decided to side with the French, which they could have easily done, well, maybe not easily, but it could have been done, of course, Britain would be in trouble. How, how are you going to go there and fight against everyone? Like nobody's on your side. You, everyone there is against you because your former colonists jumped ship. So they, they decided to, you know, lighten up the restrictions, look the other way, let, let them smuggle a little bit and, and keep them happy. Uh, but, so when the war comes, they'll, they'll go to war for us. Okay? Uh, it's an interesting idea. The, the, whole, the whole thing is very interesting, this, this oppressive mercantilist system designed to control the colonists, but then they let them get away with it anyway. So interesting. And, that, and that's history. So this idea of mercantilism. Uh, led to the oops uh, led to some of the first instances of government intervention and control over the economy. Uh, it was during this period that much of the modern capitalist system was established that of course we live in today. Uh, internationally, mercantilism encouraged the many European wars of the period. It, it fueled European imperialism because the rest of Europe was angry that that, that England was cornering the market in the New World. Uh, but it also angered colonists who wanted to take advantage of trade opportunities themselves. Uh, so American merchants, of course, felt it was oppressive and resulted in lost opportunities for them, notwithstanding the solitary neglect part of it. But that was a small part. They didn't, they didn't let them do it on a huge level, just enough to keep them happy, okay? Uh, and and the, the American colonists began to... to to start to question their their role, you know, all, all we do is lose opportunities to these people that we've created. They're, we live here; it's our opportunities. And then we 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 go through all this trouble to enrich a mother country. That the colonists at this by this time were increasingly feeling alienation from. Okay? So so the colonists are separating from the, from the English, and the English are concerned, and we've got to figure out a way to rein them in, get them back under control. It was their own fault. They, they, they let them run themselves for so long that they became pretty spoiled. But now it's you know, starting to get out of hand. you got this war approaching, and you know, what, what are we going to do, and how do we gain control of these people? So James II was the king of England, not for very long, four years. Um, the last Roman Catholic, and as we'll see, deposed in what was called the Glorious Revolution of 1688. <clears throat> That's European history. We're not going to get deep into that, but it does have an effect here. Okay. So uh, James was apprehensive about the New England colonies' increasingly independent ways, uh, particularly upset by their ignoring, by their open ignoring of the Navigation Acts. You know, even though they were looking the other way. I mean, what? So confusing. Okay. Uh, James was concerned about the continuing military threat that was posed by the French and their Indian allies. So that was an additional reason to tighten control of the colonies. 
So I'm, I'm moving ahead a little bit. I, I, I mentioned before, Salatari neglect, they didn't want to lose their, their loyalty. As, as the French and Indian Wars approached, by that time, it was obvious there would be a war. And there was no way it, by then for the colonists to, to, to jump to the French, okay? And the British realized that. So they stopped patronizing them uh, to keep them on their side. By this time, they didn't have any real choice. Uh, and there was no time at this point to change allegiances. Even if, even if they wanted to do that, if they wanted to do that, they should have done it a long time ago. So James comes up with this idea called the Dominion of New England. Uh, 1686, he determines that we're going to take all of New England and join it into one administrative merger, one colony called the Dominion of New England. So from, you know, you're talking about all the colonies in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, uh, all these different colonies, uh, bring them into one colony. Um, and According to James, it, it was to consolidate them, but but everyone knew it was a, it was a way to gain control over them to rein them in. Uh, but the British said, no, no, the creation of the Dominion is a thoughtful move, not punitive. So what does punitive mean? It means to punish. Uh, England claimed it was not punishing the colonies uh, for their lack of respect for British laws. It was to unify them and bring them together for purposes of defense and administrative control. Of course, that, that, was a, that was a blatant lie. Okay, That was not at all what he was doing. He wanted to control them. So this is a harsh ruler, unbending, stubborn. He, he felt that there were too many different societies and religions in the colonies that made them hard to manage. Too many religions. Okay, uh, That's very European. Go back to that state religion. Don't let any other religions be, be around. No, no relig religious freedom. Uh, so he wanted authoritarian control over the colonies like he had in England to make it more like England. So his dominion uh, would become a, a new royal province, okay? And this dominion would extend from Maine to New Jersey uh, to make the colonial governments more obedient, and it would be managed under a single ruler in Boston. So he nullified the charters of Connecticut and Rhode Island and he merged them with Massachusetts and Plymouth. He then added New York and New Jersey to create one huge colony uh, instead of all these different unique with different personalities. Um, but, but the colonists did see it as a punishment. It, they saw it as a reduction in their rights. Uh, they saw it as a new way to monitor them and control them, to solidify royal control over all the colonies. To them, it was a loss of independence, no town meetings, uh, resulted in, in a diminishment of self-rule. This created unrest in the colonies. Uh, so the king attempts to set up a dominant system in America that was similar to the one the English set up in Ireland. Strict and harsh. Diminished people's rights. I mentioned before that the Irish did not care for the English. This is why. They did the same thing there. And James uh, installed uh, what's called a stooge, uh, Sir Edmund Andros, to rule the dominion. An aristocrat to rule, not the nicest person. You have no more privileges left, left you than not to be sold for slaves. Uh, he questions the Puritan religion. Uh, the colonists had left their rights behind when they left England. And this is this is a this is a a, a a you know a a rough guy. That this is a guy that's not here to to help. He's here to to dominate. So what do I mean by stooge? Uh, Oops. A stooge is a person who serves merely to support or assist others, particularly in doing unpleasant work. So a stooge is someone that, that a, uh, a person of a higher uh, standing would, would send to do his dirty work. So James II sends, sends Andros to do his dirty work okay? and, and gain control of the colonists and oppress them and, and tax them and, and do all you can to abuse them. Okay. Uh, interesting point of view by the English at this point. It was going so well with with mercantilism and all the commerce and wealth. Why not just let it stay? Let 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 them have a little piece of the pie, and they would have been happy. And we might be living in the British states of America today. But they they have to have it all. It's greed, selfishness, and this is a trait of of the English in this era. Uh, so so Andrews comes in to to end local legislative rule and self-rule 
that, that had always been a valued commodity in the colonies. People had to worship the Church of England, so the Puritans have a problem with that. They, they were trying to purify and be different. The pilgrims don't want to do that. Uh, the Catholics in Maryland don't want to do that. It had been about, uh, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say freedom of religion yet, but the colonies were had had a system set up of toleration that they were, they were allowing uh, other religions to be there. Perhaps not mix, uh, but it's okay that you have your own your own your own colony and practice that religion. James says no to all of that. From now on, you all have to become part of the Church of England. He took away the colony's land charter and wanted to charge them rent. The, the colonies have to pay him to, to to rent the land that, of course, he's prospering from. Selfishness to a very high degree here. This is a very important part of the story. This almost happened, and if this had happened, if they, if they had gained that kind of control in the colonies, it would have stymied the, the thoughts that were developing of freedom and liberty and revolution because it would have brought them under control. Okay? And, and the English colonies would have become much more like Europe and probably would have stayed that way, and perhaps there wouldn't have been a revolution. Okay? So why didn't it happen? You have what's called the Glorious Revolution that I mentioned earlier. So James was overthrown due to the rising Catholic influence he was supporting in the Glorious Revolution led by William of Orange. So William of Orange overthrew James, and with him went his dominion idea also. So, so again, I'm not going to ask you a question about the Glorious Revolution. Um, I want you to just see how close it came in the colonies to become a much more harsh uh, Europe-like uh, existence than it actually did. When this didn't happen, that the self-rule and the colonial assemblies would continue, although later you can have a war about it and it would come to an end. But the point is, is that it, uh, you know freedom to run their own affairs continued for the colonists, which of course helped them to to at some point gain the confidence to uh, decide to have a revolution. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, it's at this time, to, to wrap this up, at this time, the philosopher John Locke, English philosopher, and he, and we'll talk more about him um, in the next chapter also, uh, he wrote a pamphlet called, called Treatises on Government in 1690. So John Locke's an English philosopher, Enlightenment thinker. I doubt that he'd ever set foot in the Americas, uh, but, but perhaps the most influential person uh, as far as how the United States, when they came to be, decided to build their government and their society. Uh, it's the it's the it's the thinking of John Locke. Whenever law ends, tyranny begins. So, so the the 18th century is the era of revolution and the common people fighting against tyranny. It starts slow, but the American Revolution will be the first big one, and then more war will follow. So John Locke. Uh, very important words that would influence the formation of the United States. So this is a person that you will very probably have a question about. So understand who John Locke is. Okay? So John John Locke has these radical ideas, such as he he renounces the idea of a divine right monarchy, the divine right chosen by God. Rulers in Europe had said, "God chose my family. My son will become my my successor." And you never can break away. It doesn't matter how how poor that person is as a leader, they become the next king. And, of course, the peasants and serfs suffer. John Locke says, no, there's no such thing as a divine right monarchy. God is not choosing rulers. And he suggests in, in place of a divine right monarchy, we should put in rule by the consent of the governed. So that's very much who we are today in the United States. We we, the, we vote and on, 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 on uh, people that are running for office and, and laws and propositions. American people vote. It's a democracy. So this, is, this, this idea, you could argue, starts with John Locke. John Locke claimed that people had inalienable rights to life, liberty, and property. Of course, Thomas Jefferson would use those same words in the Declaration when he'd say life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Why didn't Jefferson say property? I, I don't think he wanted to let go of, of the idea that anybody could own property, so he changed it to pursuit of happiness, whatever that meant. 
So understand that the, the glorious revolution happened. This is a result of it. And, 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 and this, this oppressive, uh, you know, cruel uh, ruler, James II, uh, was deposed. And with him went his, his dominion and, and his ideas. And in its place, thinking began to change. Uh, you know, the, the dominion was broken up. And, and restored to what it had been before for the most part. Andros was removed and arrested. So that's the stooge, okay? Uh, the colonists somewhat got their got their their colonies back and they re-implemented their own type of rule that was somewhat outside of England because England just been been overthrown by or James anyway by by the uh, glorious revolution. So the colonists were able to kind of rewrite a little bit, and they decided to moving forward, we are not going to re-implement the rule of the Puritans. Okay, the Puritans were strict and harsh, and they come from that old school, European old school, our religion or or the highway. If you are not our religion, we're going to punish you and maybe kill you. Uh, I mentioned before the Puritans talk about you know virtue and morality, predestination, and being a member of the elect and living to serve God and, and you know, uh, gain salvation for their sins. And on the other side of it, they're harsh to people, abusive to people, abusive to women, and um, committed atrocities on the natives. So the, the colonists refused to implement the rule of the Puritans. Uh, and, and so the Puritans somewhat diminish in, in power here. And the, but, but what's key about this, it, it's the precursor to separation of church and state. Uh, so that we'll talk about later. But this new idea begins in the in the American colonies. Uh, you know, if we ever get on our own, we're not going to have a state religion that everyone has to, you know, bow to and 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 uh, you know uh, be part of and 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 worship and and pay homage and money to. We're going to let people do what they want here. So the way to do that in their minds is is to separate church and state. So people today. Especially, you know, religious people, Christian people think that that's an insult. It, it's not at all. It's quite the opposite. The idea is to not not have an America, the United States, that, that's a Catholic country or a Protestant country or a Jewish country that everybody has to become. America's government should stay out of religion and let everybody worship the way that they want in private in their own lives and and do what they want. So it, it, it's a it's pro religion, not not anti. Okay. Of course, today we see many candidates that, that push Christianity and 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 family values, and they kind of wrap it all up in this religious right and, they, and trying to get votes. And and the truth is that 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 is somewhat uncon not not somewhat that's unconstitutional. That that was not what the founding fathers intended when they came up with this idea of separation of church and state. Okay, okay, that is the end of chapter three. Thank you.